Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 300, coming at you live from my couch. Because we spend the budget on things other than sets for a once a year live show. But here we go. So, this is your opportunity to interact, to write in with questions, to have some say on the show as the show happens. I do have some questions right here that people have already written in. You have the opportunity to write them in. The best place to do that, of course, because we are broadcasting on Facebook Live, is via Facebook. I am joined by great friends, Daniel and Brendan, both past guests on the show, multi-time, I guess we can say, because you interviewed me for episode 100. Sure did. So you, you've both been on the show more than once. We're shooting for the record. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think if... I think you already have it. Yeah, I think he does, because he <laughs> did that one episode where you guys were under the yeah. car together. Yeah, no. yeah, we had, we had conversations with Master Brendan Goodall, and then we had the Cobra Kai episode yes. with Sensei Scott. Then I had an interview. And an interview. So there's three, this is four, second only to me. But I don't know that I count, <laughs> because I'm always on. I think you need to take a long vacation, I'll just take a Oh my god, I, I would, I I would be... How many episodes is it? <laughs> it's actually 299 there was an episode 0 this is 301 no episode 300 um, so today what's going to happen we're going to just kind of go off the cuff there is almost nothing prepared and part of that is because it's fun for me because I spend so many minutes, hours preparing for other things for other episodes, writing out scripts, things like that. Uh, I kind of wanted to make it a little simpler. Uh, but then, secondly, there's something kind of fun that happens when we're organic. So, here we go. Um, I know there's some people watching. If there, Guys, if there are questions that come in, if they seem like they're super important to ask, like, in the moment, ask them in the moment. Otherwise, try and hold them back and, and just look for an opportune time. So I'm going to start because some of these questions that I have here come in from Sensei Craig Wareham from Exeter, New Hampshire, and some of his crew down there. And one of the questions, the first question that I, that I have here, it kind of feels like a, a good opportunity, a good way to start the show. What inspired you to create the Whistlekick Martial Arts Podcast? Um, so there's a there's a fun story around that, and it's a story that I'm I've I've told, but I don't know that I've ever told it on the air and. Um, Brendan, you might know the details on this, but I, I doubt very few other people do know. So, um, way, way back, all, all the way back in 2015, no, it was before that, it was 2014, I'm sorry. Back in 2014, as I was trying to figure out how, how we're going to make Whistlekick pop, how are we going to get this to go? Because there was product, and people liked it. And I couldn't figure out how to, how to get over the goal line. How are we going to sell stuff? And I knew I wanted to have a podcast. But originally it wasn't going to be me on the air because I've got a lot to do. And sometimes I'm shy. I know a lot of people kind of get surprised at that when they, when they, when they meet me in person. And, and, you know, maybe I'm being a little shy. Or when we have a conversation, they find out that about me. I'm... I'm really good at playing a role, kind of like an actor. So here I am. I'm playing the role of Jeremy, the host of the podcast of episode 300. But day to day, if I don't have a role to play and we're having some kind of social interaction, I'm kind of shy. So I approached a friend, a good friend, who had some technical skill, who had expressed some help, I'm sorry, some desire in helping with Whistlekick. And that man was none other than Mr. Glenn Stafford, who was episode two. And Mr. Stafford the big old jerk that he is, decided one day to up and nearly die. He had a pretty massive stroke, and that kind of that changed things. And, you know, he's okay. Uh, he's obviously alive. He's been on the show. He continues to get better. He's training again. And, and he and I have conversations. So it's not like I'm saying something I wouldn't say to him. He knows if he's watching that, that I'm being playful. But what did that mean? That meant that here we had this great idea for a show. Uh, he and I had talked a bit about format and what we thought it would look like. 
And I wanted the show, but there was nobody to host it. And as with many, many things in my life, including Whistle Kick, it became, hey, I guess I'll do it. So jumped in and haven't looked back. There we go. Things are clicking. Somebody was messaging you. Oh. Go away, people that are messaging me personally. Message, you can, you can comment on the, on the live video. I'm not gonna. I think you'd want to answer the question. <gasps> mm. well, Is, was it a planned Wednesday? <laughs> do I have plans Wednesday? Hmm, maybe. Depends on who's <laughs> asking. Uh, yeah, so, you know, as I share these stories or these anecdotes, if, you know, if you guys could kind of put yourself in the, the place that I do when I'm interviewing a guest, which is to pretend that I don't know anything, I don't know the history of the guest or anything, so if you can put yourselves in the position of the audience, you know, maybe not knowing these stories, not knowing me as well, because honestly, most people that are watching, listening, Later on, because, yeah, we are going to release this on the podcast feed. They're not going to know me as well as you guys do. So if you have some follow-up or thoughts or whatever, let it rip. Brendan's raising his hand. Yes, Brendan? I did have a question. So you were, I know Glenn very well. I didn't realize that the format wasn't going to be what it turned into. What was it going to be more like originally, aside from you not being the host? Well, that was really as far as we'd gotten. I mean, we knew format-wise that we wanted an interview show. Uh, at that point, we had not discussed anything about the Thursday show. So anybody that might be, I don't even want to say new to the show, because we did, what, 37 interview episodes before we rolled out the first Thursday show? Excuse me. And we've been doing two shows a week since then, so two and a half years. I mean, it's been a long time. But early on, it was just going to be once a week. It was just going to be that interview format. And then, really, the, the initial impetus for, for the Thursday show was looking at the way all podcast rankings go, and it's the five-day-a-week shows that crush, the seven-day-a-week shows that crush because they have that many more releases, and so it pushes them up in rankings, so more people find them in rankings, so more people listen, yada, 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 yada. Um, but you're also making the best farm gear and apparel, so you got other stuff you got to do, too. There's a lot to do, yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, not too long ago on the Facebook group, which I know both, you guys are both part of, and for those of you out there watching, listening, you may not be part of it, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. It is a, an approval-only group, and that's to keep out spammers. And, and I think that's really it. I don't think we've ever had anybody else try to join that, that we denied membership for. It's just, you know, we're just keeping a gate up on that. One of the questions that I posed in there in the last couple of weeks was, do you guys want a third episode a week? And there was some discussion about it. Sometimes we have some good discussion about it, about things in that group. And what it came down to was no. <laughs> and that's fine. I was actually a little thankful. I was afraid that people were going to say, we want five days a week because I don't know what we were going to do with that. Honestly, a third episode a week was, was likely to become clip shows or themed clip shows, you know, stringing quotes together from various guests saying similar things. Riding in cars with Jeremy? Riding in cars with Jeremy. The unofficial name of, of the episodes that I've done with you and mm -hmm. Mr. Paul Milholan. Who is watching, by the way? He is watching. Hi, Paul. Yay, my friends are watching. <laughs> You're all my friends. <sighs> Without you watching, I would be a crazy person talking into a microphone. But now I'm a crazy person talking into a microphone with purpose. So that's cool. All right. So that's really where the show came from. Obviously, it's come a long way. And, you know, I was reflecting today, realizing that had it not been for the show, this multitude of people that I know, that I consider my friends in the martial arts, I wouldn't have met. And I think the easiest anecdote for it, the easiest way to think about it is the way I met Bill Wallace. You know, I met Bill Wallace because I put on an event with him, with, with Master Hughes and Alexander, who was episode one, um, one of the biggest supporters of the show and of, of things that I've done, so I really appreciate him. But we put on a, um, an event here in Vermont with Bill Wallace, and later on I got to bring him on the show. And from that relationship, I've met literally dozens of people who have now been on the show 
and I've gotten to train with them and I've gotten to travel and I've learned so much. And, and almost everything good in my life over the last couple of years can at least indirectly be tracked back to the show, which is really surreal. And I've had these moments where I've considered, should we pivot? Should Whistlekick only be the podcast? And the answer is no, because it's really hard to turn a podcast into anything lucrative. We'd be out looking for sponsorships from a handful of companies that could actually afford to do it. And so no, we'll continue to make our own stuff. More and more stuff. There were piles of samples until about an hour before you guys got here in the other room. More samples that did not pass muster. So yelling at factories again. What? <laughs> so, all right. So that was the first question. Have any other questions come through? Yep, lots of thumbs up, lots of waving. Yay, thumbs up and waving. I have a follow-up question. Go ahead, follow-up How question. How did you come up with the questions you ask? Um, obviously, you've switched mm. to a slightly more free form, but you followed a pretty yeah outline for the first few couple hundred episodes. Yeah, yeah. So those questions, those questions are, are, are kind of an interesting piece of the show. Again, for anybody who might be really new to the show, what Brendan's referencing, uh, you guys are in, one of you is in shorts and the other of you is wearing socks in my living room, so I'm not going to use titles if you're cool with that. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Be offended if you use titles. <laughs> um, so the question about the about the format of the questions. If you go back, especially to the very early days of the show, I asked a very rigid set of questions in a very rigid order. Um, And I've backed off on that, and I'll explain why in a minute. But the reason those questions were what they were in that order, and that order actually changed. There was a little bit of organic shift over time. The whole goal, I knew early on what type of interviewer I wanted to be. Uh, when, When I look at interviews... My favorite interviewer is James Lipton from Inside the Actor's Studio. If anybody's seen that show, he's brilliant because he can take very simple questions and dig into what people really mean and ask follow-up questions. And so that was the intended format. The reason I was so rigid early on is because I wasn't comfortable. I was not, I don't consider myself, I still don't consider myself a good interviewer. I think I'm, I'm acceptable now, but early on, I was not very good. So I needed that structure of the questions to lean on to ask people, you know, these follow-ups. And, and you'll, if you listen to the early episodes, you'll even hear moments where I didn't know what to do. It was clear that there was more to get at, but I wasn't sure how to get it. So I just kind of made a hard cut and asked the next question. And I'm sure that some of the early guests weren't so thrilled about that. And you know what? That's, it is what it is. There's not a lot I can do about that. But as things have gotten more comfortable, uh, I've been willing to work without the questions. I still interview with the same sheet. There's a printout that I work from, and I jot lots of notes on it, and those notes go out to Julius, or I might refer back to them. Julius is the, the amazing gentleman who does the editing and helps me with a ton of stuff. I uh, also want to give a shout out to Lester, who helps put together some of the newer Thursday episodes. Thanks. Couldn't do this without both of you guys. Actually, I could. Uh, I would just never sleep. Uh, and both of you do better jobs than I do on your respective tasks. So I appreciate that. But when I interviewed um, Sensei David Hughes, who was a, a referral from Mr. Ron Amram, he picked up the phone. And we just started to go. And we just rolled off. And it was it was crazy because I was so comfortable talking to him. And he was so comfortable, to, excuse me, talking to me that I, I got to kind of take a step back and realize what my interviewing style could be if I was more comfortable, if I made an effort to be comfortable. Unfortunately, that was one of the five episodes that was lost due to the the tech issues that drove me crazy back in February, January, February is when we lost those, those episodes. We interviewed again, but from there on, I had a goal of being able to interview without needing that really deep structure. 
And what that's allowed me to do is listen more to what the, inter- the, the guest is saying and find the follow-ups from there. We got a question. Hey, I'll take it. So you, t- you told us earlier about why you got started, the origin stories of the, of the show. Yeah. Uh, James uh, Villemaire, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, I uh, said he met you at Terry's symposium. Yeah, what's up, James? Um, he's wondering about your drive to run the show. So you told us about why you started. What's your drive? Why are you still going? Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest because I'm I'm feeling like very candid today. Um, Mondays aren't always an easy day for me transitioning off the weekend, uh, and and this is going to be a very circuitous route to the answer. But James, I'll get there. Uh, and if you are who I'm, I'm thinking you are from the symposium, that was a really fun moment. Um, James might have been my first, like my first, wait, you're that guy moment, which was super cool. It made me feel mildly important. So everybody can use that ego boost once in a while. Um, there are times when I'm very aware of how beneficial this show has been to my life, to my personal growth, to obviously the organization. And then there are times where I feel like crap. I feel, you know, maybe I'll come, come off an interview. And there, there are interviews where if you go back, you listen, you can tell I, I felt useless. Actually, hopefully you can't tell. But I suspect some of you guys that know me well or have listened to most or all of the episodes can hear that the energy just isn't there. Um, ironically, sometimes those episodes do really well. Thank God. But... On those days, the the drive is for you. I've made a commitment to release an episode twice a week. And I'll do it. I'll do whatever I have to do. And that's why we try to have episodes in the can, um, you know, ready to go. Like right now, I think we're about five, six weeks out with episodes, which makes it a little hard to schedule because guests don't want to know that their show is coming out in, you know, three months. But... You know, it is what it is because it makes it a lot less stressful for me. I think tomorrow I've got two or three episodes scheduled and that tends to be the norm. I'll I'll have two or three scheduled every Tuesday. We tend to record on Tuesdays for a while and then I'll just push back a bunch of people for a while. That's probably the cat making noise. Uh, How cool is this, Jeremy? Somebody's adult class, Dennis Campo. Yeah. Dennis's class is, has this broadcast running. Dennis, you're running the show in class? You're the How best. How cool is that? Love you, buddy. James um, also says you were right about him. Oh, he was. nice. Yeah, James was a cool guy. We got to work together. Um, Dennis is a perfect example of someone I met only because of this show. And we got to train together and hang out together when I was in Florida a couple weekends ago with, with the Superfoot crew. And, and um, you know, I've said on the show a lot, martial artists are, are good people. Martial artists tend to be better people than your general... Um, slice of humanity and I think he's a he's a good example of that that you know we just we just click I mean he's just he's a he's a goofy dude and and loves to train and has good people around him hopefully people say that about me someday I think you've grown a lot as an interviewer I've been getting caught up because I have a shorter commute now so I can't get through Mm. a whole episode now I have to I have to listen at work more and, and it's um, which is actually great to have a job that I can do that. Yeah. But I think you've grown a lot Damn, as an interviewer. Uh, you say you're acceptable. I think you're I think you're a good interviewer. No, well, thank I you. you are. I appreciate that. It, it means a lot. It's you know I wonder how different an interviewer I would be if I was in person with people. Uh, I, I've always been someone who I, I tend to be pretty empathetic, empathic. Some people would use that word. Uh, Picking up facial cues. It's always harder to have a conversation over the phone or over Skype, which is what we do. And, you know, we don't record video with these Skype calls because Skype is dumb and the video will prioritize over the audio. And that's just silly. I'd rather give you guys no video than garbled audio. So that's why we do it the way we do it. Uh, But what would that look like if I was sitting face-to-face with people? Or what would it look like if... I was, you know, if I could have the video, if I trusted the the internet connection on both ends. You know, when I interviewed 
both of you, we were in person. Right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you were the, you were the. Bre- was the test Brennan was the first one. The yep, I remember. What was that video episode you did with uh, with Hanshi Bruce, Bruce Justinick? Uh, that was uh, so last year at uh, Terry Dow's symposium. It was Hunchy Jutnik interviewing Bill Wallace. Right. And I did, if you go back, if you watch that video, every time I see it, it drives me crazy. Because I did the worst job of arranging the gear. Because I had to walk into frame every time I checked on things. And as soon as they started going, I realized my mistake. Because I don't have a ton of experience doing that. I, I, I have some AV experience. Um, I ran my school's TV station for a couple of years, but I didn't actually, like, I was on camera. I wasn't behind the camera, so I don't have a ton of doing that. And, uh, yeah, so it drives me nuts. Well, why do you bring that up? Because it was video, or? No, it was just, I, it, uh, it was another format. It, it, we, yeah. You got to see the interaction between two people. You were talking about the interaction, being able to see. Yeah. I mean, because it, uh, the... The receiving of that information is also better for the listener, for the the consumer of that media, to to see it. So, sure. Yeah. Sure. That was, that was a re- really awesome. Any any video that you've done has been. Awesome. Thank you. I, I think a question for me is: Have you, because the people I know you've interviewed face to face, you've all known fairly well at that point. Has there been someone you haven't known? Who Here, why don't Why don't you come sit? Like, if you're, why don't you come sit and you can ask some questions for a little bit, and then you guys can. Can swap. We do have a nice queue coming up, but I'll finish. So, have you had any face-to-face interviews with people that you haven't known for years at this point? No, no, I haven't had any of that. And you know, when I go to events, I'll often bring my gear. I'll bring. I don't bring the the big camera anymore. Um, I'll bring the GoPro. Uh, I've done a number of videos. People have probably seen them with the GoPro on the dash as I drive away from an event and need to rant about something. But no, it's always been people that I've known. And we even kind of joked about this. I don't think you had gotten to hear yet how different my voice is. I hear it, so I'm sure everyone else hears it. How different my voice is when I'm talking to someone versus on a Thursday episode where I'm just talking into the nothing. And I was, I was aware of that when I started the show. You know, I went into that kind of intro voice. You can hear it if you listen to the intro to an episode, even an interview episode, versus the actual meat of the episode. Hi, this is Jeremy, and this is Gig Martial Arts Radio. You know, that's kind of an exaggerated version, but I'm not going to talk to you that way, if we're, if, especially if we're face to face. Because, oh hey, Brendan, how are you? What's, it just it sounds so artificial, it sounds so fake yeah. that you're not going to resonate with it. You thought about doing a follow up with somebody? Like, I could think of multiple people. I have, and here and here's the fear the because there are a lot of people that have asked. I mean, there, there are people, good friends, who have asked. The, my fear in doing second episodes is that now everyone gets the right to have a second episode. And trying to balance that with the constant influx of requests for guests. They, they're, we are at a point now where I do not say yes to everyone. Mm-hmm. Because so many guests come through and some of them really just want to be self-promotional, you know, and, and I'm not, I'm not opposed to somebody pushing their book or their online program or whatever they've got going, but we've got to do it in the martial arts radio way. It's got to be in a way that people get value out of. It can't just be a commercial. And so people will write in and I've got this event coming up. Can I come on the show and talk about the event you have coming up? No. I mean, we can drop that in at the end, but 98% of the show is going to be real content that stands without that be an option for a third episode a week if you really want to do that i don't know when i would record it you know right now i mean if i showed you guys my calendar i won't show it on the air but i'll show you my calendar here my phone is here because this is the stuff you miss in purely audio formats by the way Yeah. This is my week. You know, it starts at like 7 a.m. And there are, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 things. Some of them are small. This is why throughout I know the week. if I text you after 6 a.m., I know you'll probably respond because you're up. 
I'm usually up. Yep. <laughs> I'm usually up. And sometimes I'm, you know, I've, so a, a perfect example of how I try to condense things, my morning tradition, like I don't function quickly. Like I can, I can write back if you text me, but I'm not, unless, unless my day is about to blow up or I'm trying to keep it from blowing up, I am not at my desk before 8 a.m. And I used to wake up, get my coffee, sit here, watch the Daily Show or whatever from the night before, and then make breakfast. But the moment I sat down, you know, what happens when you sit down on the couch for the TV, your productivity, your, your motivation drops. So now I don't generally watch TV. I'm in the kitchen and I've got a, um, a Chromecast mm -hmm. on an old 19 inch flat screen TV from like 2003. It's got like seven pixels in it. And I watch something on Netflix on that, you know, and while I make breakfast, you know, so I, I, I got an, I got a half hour back, you know, I do that kind of stuff. So. Got a couple of questions rolling in. Yeah. And some plus ones to the questions. So the, um, I actually had a scroll up, the mouse turned off. Uh, if you right click, no, it, it's uh, it's an auto off for battery save. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So this is a question that I'm actually also going to plus one, but uh, Laura, drop your bow staff and do push-ups, uh, Napoli. Um, <laughs> that has plus one this comment already. But, um, but, um, Hold on, I got to explain. If I'm going to laugh hysterically, I have to explain this. Um, okay. So Master Napoli, Laura Napoli, who uh, has been a great friend, great friend of the show, and has taught the last two years, right, at training day? She was there the first year. Yes, yes. But definitely both years, yeah. Um, you know, her rule, if you're learning bow from her, is that if you drop it, you do push-ups. doesn't matter what you're doing. doesn't matter if it's your first day. I didn't even take a class. I just, I got so much, I, I would hear clang, 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 and I hear the, hear the bow bouncing <laughs> on the ground and look over, and sure enough, someone's doing push-ups. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So the, the question is, again, so there's two plus ones. There's yeah. yours and mine. Um, your first tournament brought a whole new experience for me. This is from, the original question comes from Stacy Ann Kaylee Grove. Um, brought a whole new experience for me. I met new and different arts and styles. With what you learned from that, will you ever do another? <laughs> I know your answer for this already, what your knee-jerk response is, but... I All right, like so it. the tournament. <laughs> oh, the tournament. See, this, this, is, this is the advantage to me being candid is that I, can, I, can, I will talk about this in a way that I don't normally talk about this. All right, so background. April 2nd, 2016, freaking moth. April 2nd, 2016, Whistlekick held a tournament uh, in Vermont, depending on your perspective, central or northern Vermont. And I, I did everything. I did literally everything I could think of to do. I included every one. I include. I did everything. Um, I think. I think we had like a dozen different divisions. Between creative and traditional, and and the various breaking and point sparring and continuous sparring and fusion, which is kind of like a a, a, a lighter, um, you know, hybrid. Sparring. I'm trying not to use the term MMA. Um, weapons and, and everything. We just had everything. And we ran seminars concurrently and and brought in vendors and just... My goal was to have the biggest, best martial arts competition I could. And in a few ways it succeeded. And in other ways it fell completely flat on its face. And I am still embarrassed about the way that event kicked off because I set the expectations so high. Because everything I do, I set the expectations high. I, it's, it's just part of who I am. I want everything to be perfect the first time. Numbers were not where they were supposed to be. In some way, anything and everything that could have gone wrong did. And it took me days to recover um, 
in some ways I'm still not recovered. What was helpful is after that, I took all of that knowledge and turned it into a book called How Not to Run a Tournament. It's actually, there's a full course behind it with all of the templates I built. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. And I would, I would guarantee, and actually there is a guarantee on it. If, if somebody was to buy that book or buy those cor the course with all the templates and, and everything and not at least make the money back that you spent, I'll give you your money back. No questions asked. So the question about would I ever do that event again? Maybe. And, and here, here's why it's shifted from a, from a knee jerk no to a maybe. The goal was never to have a profitable grand event that added to Whistlekick's bottom line. At the end of the day, I lost thousands of dollars on that event. But the goal was to get other promoters to realize that there were things that they could do, that, their, that tournaments, competitions could be more than they had been up until that time. At Whistlekick, we have a really simple business model. And if you are, are if you follow the tech industry at all, you might recognize that I stole this from Google. Google's business model is if it gets them on the internet, they'll probably see our stuff. So let's get them on the internet. Then we'll make money. Whistlekick's business model is if it gets them into or keeps them in martial arts, it is under our umbrella or should be. Competitions are something that could be a lot better in the martial arts space. And I think most people agree with that. The problem is we don't agree how. So my push with that event was simply to put every idea I could imagine out there and hope that other promoters would see it and take some of those ideas and run with them. And if I look at it, if that is the definition of success, it succeeded because there were people even within weeks that were implementing some of those ideas at their events. And the fact that it is still discussed tells me it was probably less of a failure than I see it as. And so that makes me feel a little better. One person said, um, best tournament ever. Hmm. Best tournament ever. Well, thank you. You also have some queries about why you're not using chopsticks to catch the mob. <laughs> so here's a fun story about chopsticks. Um, I didn't know how to use chopsticks until my late 20s. Everyone tried. I was in, I was in restaurants all over the place, like in Chinatown and San Francisco, like everyone tried to teach me how to use chopsticks and I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. Like I would try and just, and then one day I'm sitting at a sushi place and I'm like three bites in and I'm holding the chopsticks and I'm realizing I've started my meal with chopsticks. I don't know how it happened. N nothing changed. Suddenly my body just said, you can use chopsticks now. So I use chopsticks now. The ironic thing about that is that it's actually bad etiquette to use chopsticks on sushi. In Japan, if you, if you don't use your fingers, it, you're supposed to use your fingers on sushi. That's, that's the funny part. <laughs> it's awesome, though. Well, if I go to a sushi restaurant in Japan... I wish I could do anything without realizing that I was doing it and then just like, oh, now I can, I can do this now. That has never happened to me, ever. I would love that. It's the only time that's happened. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. It's, you know, there, there's, there's a certain element to the body. And, and I think that as martial artists, we get a unique, maybe not unique. I think there are plenty of athletics where you get this, where you just, you, you have enough skill that you trust your mind enough to shut it off and just kind of let things happen. You know, you've probably experienced this sparring, Brendan, where you're not consciously thinking of what you're going to throw, but all of a sudden, bam, you pull off something pretty, but it was perfect. You know, in that moment, that foot went exactly where it needed to be or something like that. And I think that that's just what it was. I wasn't thinking about, oh my God, I don't know how to use chopsticks. I just, I was probably just, because I was around other people doing it, my brain just said, just do. We have a question. Before I say that, there's another comment here that says, about back to the tournament that mm. says it was an awesome tournament from the perspective of being a helper slash participant it was honestly the best one I've ever attended mm. thank you 
Thank you. So the other question we have is from. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna test something with the mic. I'm gonna move this back because you guys are, are interacting a little bit more than I was expecting. So I'm gonna push this back a little bit. I think it'll still come through okay with me, but hopefully it'll pick you guys up a little better. Sure. So the other question is uh, from Jenny Nather. Uh, Hi, Jenny. It says Matt and Jenny here. Uh, who would you consider your dream interview, living or otherwise? I remember you got chills and you were like freaking out when you did uh, Demura Sensei. Um, there was video of me crying a, on it, YouTube about that yeah, one. And there's been a few, there's been a few people that have like sort of taken your breath away. Uh, yeah. Who, who's, who's left on that, on that list? So admittedly, when, when I started the show, there was a list of two people that I was told I would never get on the show. Chuck Norris and Fumio Demura. And then Fumio Demura came on the show. So Chuck Norris is no longer on that list. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of me needing the right tie to the right people. I know multiple people who have black belts from Chuck Norris who are still actively engaged with him. Um, so I believe at some point the planets will align and, and, you know, I might have to fly to Texas to make it happen, but that's probably the only interview I would actually travel to do, uh, outside somebody, you know, like, like Jackie Chan or Jet Li. Um, obviously those movie celebrities are high on the list, but I think they're high on the list more because of the draw it would bring to the show. When I think about the people that I've had the most fun talking to, um, it's, it, it's, it's not the celebrities. You know, I, I, the, when I think back to, you know, when I talked to, to Ron Amram, I mean, we just, we hit it off. You know, we just had a great time talking. Uh, I had the same thing with, with Scott Boland. You know, so I look at it a little bit differently. You know, in, in one sense, it's who am I looking forward to becoming friends with? And who am I looking forward to growing the show and growing Whistlekick by bringing on? Does that answer your, the question? <laughs> okay. We have a kind of few questions that are similar, so I'm going to combine yeah, them. please. Um, Scott asks, what is the best thing that has happened on martial arts radio or what's the pick in general since episode 200? And Rob since 200. had a question of, do you have a goal for episodes 301 through 399? <sighs> the best thing that's happened since 200. The best thing that's happened since 200 is is me finally starting to accept that this show has a place in the martial arts landscape. Um, let me go a little bit deeper. Since like episode 50, people have come up to me and said, you're doing important work. This is valuable. Thank you for chronicling these stories. But I tend to be a pretty modest guy. I tend to be a pretty humble guy. Um, you guys both know that about me. So for someone to say, you're doing important work, and some people you go even further, the cat may end up on set. There's a cat. You can't see the cat. She's right there. You She's sniffing the tripod. Mm -hmm. Keep talking. Huh? You instantly get more views when there are cats. Zuzu, do something catty. Remind me to tell you, there's a tangent, unrelated, I'll tell you in a moment. Um, some people have even gone so far as to say, you've done more for martial arts than, and sometimes they'll name certain people, or they'll, they'll speak in generalities, and that I get really uncomfortable with that. But I'm starting to realize, because we've now had two show guests pass away. Uh, Hanshi Jim Smith, who was in the teens like 17, 19 episode. Uh, he passed away a few months ago. And I received a n number of messages from people who were active or former students of his that found the show after that. 
And so they got the opportunity to listen to the words of a man that they really loved and respected from a, from that snapshot in time. You know, it wasn't across his life. It was that day. It was how he felt about speaking that day. Uh, the same thing with Grandmaster Jun Ring, who, if you've listened to that episode, um, it's a different episode. You know, it's, it's about where he was at at that moment. Not, it wasn't as reflective as some episodes have been. And I've said it before, I'm just, I'm a steward. You know, I'm, I'm guiding this show. I'm the guy with the insanely good luck to be able to do this. And I'm fortunate to be able to do that. So I think that's, that's kind of going to be my, my dodgy answer for, for the first part about, you know, in the last hundred episodes, the next hundred episodes, what am I looking forward to? Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what my interview style looks like as I become more comfortable with this looser, more, more flowy method. One of the things I've learned at this point is that I, I am much more likely to book a guest if someone makes an introduction. I've, I've reached out to a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people that, that listeners would know who have not been on the show. And I often get responses. Quite often I don't. The, the more celebrity they are, the less likely I am to get a response. Interestingly, the more they think they're a celebrity, the more likely I am to get a no. There, there are some people on the blacklist who think that they're big deals. That's fine. You'll come around. I have no doubt. Um, I shouldn't say it's a blacklist. It's a gray list. I'm not going to reach out to them again. If they, if they want to come on the show... Um, so yeah, if there's somebody you want to see on the show, the best thing you can do is, is help me get them. Telling me you want to hear from Chuck Norris. All I can do is do the things I've already done, which haven't worked. I mean, in the end, he's going to interview you anyways, because... <laughs> Chuck because Chuck Norris would interview me on my own show. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I think oh my, the memes, the memes we could do if Chuck, if I talked to Chuck Norris, you know, it, episode whatever of martial arts radio with Chuck Norris, 30 seconds long. It's just him going, yep. The most downloaded episode of all time. And it would be too. And that's the funny part. Uh, the tangent, I promised. So years ago, I was, I don't remember what it was. I was selling something on eBay and I used to have a pet rabbit and the rabbit crept into the shot as I took the picture. And instead of reshooting it, because I, I do have a bit of an irreverent sense of humor, I used that photo and just in the description wrote rabbit not included. It sold very quickly. I don't remember what, what I wish I could remember what it was. So I got, I got more questions here I can ask. Tell us how that first request for an interview went. Did you get a funny response or look? Um, and these questions come in from Kara, if I recall. It wasn't so much that early on that people gave me funny looks. It was that a lot of those early folks, because they didn't have context for the show. They didn't know what the show was. Um, they hadn't listened to the show. They weren't sure how to respond. You know, early on, I mean, we, we talked about how far it was until I asked people I didn't know well. You know, people were wanted to help. They didn't want to say no. But I remember um, Sheehan Wayne Mello, who I think was episode six, he swore it was going to be the shortest interview of all time. 
No, of course it wasn't because he's he's a pretty smart guy and, and has a lot to say about martial arts, and he's done a lot. But that was a, a good example of what people said was going to happen early on. I don't really have much to say. But now that there are hundreds of episodes and they can look back and see what else we've done... I do strongly encourage and will all but browbeat people into listening to at least part of an episode to get kind of a, a, a sense of how loose it is. I like the tangents. I, I say it on the show. The best stuff is on the edges. And that's kind of my, my whole belief on, I, I think, even training, too. You know, yeah, you can come in and you can you can go to class and you can go through your basics or your sparring. But it's those classes where you do something kind of off the cuff, something new. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the instructor has to leave halfway through cause you know, they've got a sick kid and they're like, Oh, can you take over? You know, and, no, and nothing's planned and it just kind of becomes very organic. There's a lot of really good stuff there. And so that's the goal of the show is to cultivate that. Would it be out of place if I answer one of the questions here? It would not be out of it's, place if and, you answered and, one and of the I, questions. I, I don't mean this person any offense. They ask, they ask, what got you into training? What got me into training? And so, and so my answer to that is you will get the best answer if you listen to episode 100. <laughs> episode 100 is me and Jeremy talking yeah. all about that. Yeah, and if if you... So so here here's a fun thing to talk about that's weird for me. Um, if anybody wants to know why I'm wearing the hat, it's to prevent the glare. Because I'm sure it's very glaring right now because there's bright lights. I have very little hair. Um, I never imagined people wanted to know about me. That was weird. That was really weird to me when, you know, here we go, episode... Oh, I promise I'm not that tired. It's just all the talking. I'm not breathing in. Uh, episode 40 or so, people started reaching out saying, we want to know more about you. It's like, ah, ah, why? Weird. Why? Why do you want to know about me? I'm nobody. I'm just a dude with a show. The whole purpose of the show is to talk to other people. So then when episode 50 started rolling around, which I completely screwed the pooch on because it was a profile of Jet Li. Missed an opportunity there, apparently, to do something significant. As we got past that, I went, okay, well, apparently episode 100 has to be significant and it's got to be someone talking to me. And you and I had spent enough time together that I, I had a feeling your style in talking to me would be similar to the way I talk to other people. So um, I continue to get questions from people. They continue to want to know about me. And that's something I don't know I'm ever going to get over because it, it just strikes me as strange. Uh, I do understand it from a psychological point of view it's because you all hear my voice often. You don't get to see me often. But in a sense, you know some things about me. I know very few things about you unless I know who you are. So that makes sense. Um, I am working on having some people that know me well come on the show to talk about me. And in those cases, I will not be the one doing the interview. Um, so you are welcome to read into that all you want. We have a question from Andrew Baldilock Smith. And his question is, have you ever thought about interviewing a newbie, someone who's just starting out on their martial arts journey? I have. Um, I have thought about interviewing people who are new to martial arts. And the problem with that is that It would have to be a really, this per, the person would have to have, there's a cat there, I'm reaching off camera, there's a cat. Um, if I brought somebody new on, they would have to be comfortable speaking in general. Um, I've tried to do some things like that, and in each case, it, it just hasn't worked out. The person isn't confident enough in themselves. Whew. So not that being a black belt or, or equivalent competency is a hard and fast rule for coming on the show. But if you are a black belt, 
you probably have been training for a while. You probably have gotten over a bit of your nerves. You're probably able to talk about martial arts because you're passionate about it. If you're not super confident talking about things in general, about being interviewed, if you're a martial artist, all I have to do is keep poking until I find the thing about martial arts you love, and then you'll probably start talking. And that's kind of why we do it that way. If there was somebody out there that, you know, was was new that we could bring on to, to talk about martial arts in maybe a different way, that would be fun. I would actually... See, there's a lot of stuff that I want to do video-wise. That would make a great video series. Talk to somebody, you know, before their first class, after their first class, second class, 10th class, 30th class, right? And, and, and kind of build, what does that look like? It would make a fun, you know, sort of reality show. I don't have the time. You know, the minute we go from audio to video, I mean, this is, I spent four hours setting up for this. I can set up for the podcast in five minutes. So. I have a kind of tag along question to that. Have you thought about interviewing the parents of a martial artist? Just it's the, it's the same the challenge. Um, I could think of a few parents who would happily talk your ear off. But if you think about, like, it's an interesting progression to watch. Like, martial artists, as typically humble people, aren't great at talking about the intangible positive things that have Sure. Have done to them. Like they all said, like it saved my life and things like that. But if you get the outside perspective on, like, say, Brendan was here when he started martial arts at age seven, right? And as I watched him grow up, all these things that I saw that only happened to him because he was in martial arts. And that kind of stuff makes sense for like a Thursday show for a topic mm -hmm. show. But in order to coordinate that, it feels like it needs a bit more structure. And one of the things I'm looking at is bringing on yet another person. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we have it with everyone accounted for between full and part time. There are a dozen people behind the scenes, not just for the show, but for whistle kick. It's it's kind of unwieldy and really unwieldy. But I've thought about bringing on another person to do some kind of some of that coordination. That would be an interesting project to say, OK, um, you know, maybe I reach out over social media. I need parents willing to talk for five to ten minutes over the phone about the experience they had watching their children progress as human beings because of martial arts, you know, and take all that audio and edit it together. There's a lot of input on that to get the episode out. Uh, you know, that's almost, that's audio documentary. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of things. I mean, we're, there are, there are legit documentaries that we're in conversation with, with coordinating with people um, that I would love to do. But there are X number of hours in the day and X dollars to put behind projects and only so much attention I can give to things. I'd like you to state something for the camera and I have a follow-up question for that. What did you study in college? I studied computer science and philosophy. So my follow-up question for that is we hear a lot about um, your openness in the martial arts and in some cases, but not often, some slight biases that you have about people's attitudes and, and, and that they should be more positive and they should be more open, um, which are, I think, good biases to have. Um, but we don't really get to hear about your, your philosophy or the myriad of philosophies attached to martial arts from many cultures. Uh, do you think there's a place on the podcast for you to talk about how philosophy ties into this? Hmm. Is there a place on... I'm, I'm repeating in case listeners can't hear you really well. Uh, slash buying myself time. Is there a place on the show for discussing philosophies? Um, yeah, I think there's a place for everything on the show. I think part of the reason I haven't sat down and done an episode on here's what I believe is because it's evolving. 
And so much of what I believe is only articulated now because I've had similar conversations on and off the show for the last three years. Some of the things that I'm able to say, the best stuff is on the edges. Martial arts is, is personal growth through the guise of hand-to-hand combat. You know, those things have only happened. I'm only able to talk about those things in that way because I've talked about them so much. So to sit down and sit and record a whole episode about it, I mean, I could, but I don't know, just philosophy for me has always been more conversational. Well, I feel like, so you've touched on it, you've done a few, you've done some on etiquette, and I feel like etiquette is like philosophy light. <laughs> Should I get you a pair of chopsticks? Um, like, I remember, so I remember for 200, Crazy. we were here, yeah, and... This is an etiquette thing, but it comes from somewhere. It comes from some philosophy deep in the art. But you had a sword on the table. Mm. And this is because my brain can remember all kinds of crazy stuff. Kim mentioned that that was weird. That for her it felt really weird to have a a, a weapon so casually on the table. Mm. As an etiquette thing. It, but yeah. but but that's, and like for me, the first time I went to a school where they threw the belt down in front of them, and the, uh, my belt etiquette is the belt never touches the floor, and so yeah. when someone spiked it in front of them, that was something that I, I, my heart skipped a beat, it felt like. Um, but that all stems from some philosophy, and it gets deeper and deeper, sure. and, and I think that the, it could be an interesting way to, to delve into not just the history of an art, but how it affects us today as modern traditional mar- martial artists adopting etiquette in some cases discarding things and and what do we lose in the art yeah. from discarding those things no I, I like the direction you're taking that when I did the episode on etiquette it was more around here's how you determine what the proper etiquette is at a school you know if, especially if you're visiting I mean that, that was the that was the the situation I was considering when I did that episode what I try really hard not to do is present anything in such a way to say, this is the right way or the only way. And I've done, sure, how many episodes have I done around the fact that I disagree with that notion? I mean, I've, I've probably done half a dozen in various flavors. So I, I, I try to be careful because the last thing I want is for someone to tune in and for it to be their first episode I'm always thinking about that. Is what what does someone think if this is the first episode that they've tuned in? And if I start talking about philosophy in such a way that even makes them think I'm presenting a correct view, and that's not their view, you they might, tune out. I'm going to use a philosophical uh, analogy. It's a slippery slope. It is a slippery <laughs> slope. <laughs> to, yeah, if, if it could, yeah, I can see how that could. I mean, because. You're also marketing, this is a product, the podcast is a product, yeah. so it's a, I get that you want to be able to market that. So that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, it'd be an interesting line to try to walk on. I mean, I mean, it'd be interesting to record a few and see if they, if they, if they make, the, make the cut, and then I'm, I'm sure there are other episodes that never made it to the light of day, like some of your Thursday episodes that maybe didn't make the cut, but... I get about halfway through some of them. I'm like, ah, oh, this is trash. Throw it out. My, the thing I say, if anybody, you'll get this. Um, if anyone is a fan of rap music, particularly Eminem, everything he says in his verses about hating his own music and hating what he does and throwing things out and just, I've said all of those things. Just get halfway through, just figuratively crinkle it up and, Hit delete. I'm a songwriter, and I'd say probably like one out of every forty thing that things that I write stays somewhere. The rest just gets discarded as practice. Yeah. yeah. I have a question from Craig because I really don't want Daniel and I to monopolize the interview, which I know we could. <laughs> Very yeah. Easily, we yes. That well. Yep. Um, this one's from Craig, and I apologize to everyone that I'm picking and choosing which questions I find most interesting. That's fine. You have that right. <laughs> because you know what? If anybody wanted, if, if you wanted to be able to be guaranteed to ask your questions, you could have been here. Um, 
There right. were tickets available. Right? Yeah, I really am ashamed at the price I paid to get in, but it's a good price. <laughs> Not horrible. Um, Craig asks, what advice would you give to the younger 18 to 30 generation of martial arts instructors, which I find myself on the high end of, unfortunately. <laughs> but no, what, a, what, what, what advice to... Let's say newer instructors sure. might might be. Um, well, <laughs> actually, I, I will say, I will answer the younger piece too. I think I think there's something to be said for being in that kind of younger to middle age demographic. You know, that 25 to 35, which you know I have aged out of. Um, I just turned 39 on Friday. But I don't act that. I tend to conduct myself as much younger and uh, assuming that Craig is Craig that I am thinking of. He's seen me work with his students. And, you know, yeah, I, my hair might be falling out. I might have some gray in my beard. But I, I try to act like I'm 22 when I'm working with those teens. You know, I try to give them that energy back. And I think that that is the number one thing for new instructors to learn is that if you can meet your students where they're at and to give them a little bit more than you're asking them to give, especially energetically, you're going to get more from them. It's, it's leadership in a sense. If you can, I mean, you've, you've observed the, the times, you know, in our school when I've, when I've taught, um, I'm also pretty, kind of dread it because you work as hard. <laughs> but I'm right there with, yeah, with you and I, and I, I bring that energy. Up. You um, it up. You know, last Wednesday when I was coaching CrossFit, I was, I mean, my voice was half gone by the end of the first class. It was a particularly difficult workout that I was coaching. But that's just, that's, that's how I approach things. I'm going to give that energy. And I've found that if, as long as you give that energy, everything else can stink. You can not know what you're doing. You can not be sure how to present the material. You can not even know what you're looking for as an outcome for not just that class, but that drill. But if you, if you give some energy to the people that are, are training, they'll trust you. They'll try it. And honestly, most of the time when I teach, especially if I'm visiting... I don't go in with an agenda because my goal is to, especially if I'm teaching, you know, a group once, you know, I, I can't, I can't build a curriculum on that. And it's naive of me to, to try to step into that curriculum. You know, I'm looking, I'm looking to help move big rocks. You know, what are the things I can work with them on? Oh, okay. Well, let's do some drills around balance or let's do some drills around generating power from your hips or, you know, just something, you know, so I'll just, I'll go in and I'll, I'll come in, you know, dialed up to 11, you know, people don't know what to make of me, but they'll fall in line because I've exceeded their energy. There's no space for them to act out or to, that to was not one of be the there. first things I noticed. So our school is a mixed class. It's got young kids and adults, in some cases, parents training with their kids it's a fun mix, but there was a class where you came and taught, and sometimes we have, even because we have a rapport, uh, like fam uh, the familiarness, sometimes it, there's, it's, it's harder for us to corral them sometimes, but I remember that day, every single kid was so in. Like, it's actually easier, I think, in some cases to get the adults to follow in because they know how to follow the rules, but sure. kids are still testing the boundaries, but... Everybody was on, everybody was in because your energy was up and they were responding to that. Yeah. yeah. I remember that. So that, that's my answer, Craig. Mm -hmm. um, this one kind of ties in nicely. It's from Scott Bolin. Hi, Scott. He says hi back. <laughs> might not actually, but I'm assuming that he I, I would assume. <laughs> um, <laughs> would you agree that the best martial arts philosophy is one that can be applied to any style of martial art? Uh, he had a follow-up of the more fundamental the better so when you go in and I'm putting many words in his mouth right now so when you try and like go around and teach at different schools you won't hone in on anything specific unless you have intimate knowledge of the art you're going okay you're all right concept. so if we're talking about philosophy from that side okay so so I think we need to draw a line between physical philosophy 
and mental, emotional, spiritual philosophy as it relates to martial arts. If we're talking about the physical philosophy, um, I think it's I think it's layered. I think there are general principles that not everyone, but most of us would believe, and then you kind of layer on top of those. For example, um, I'm thinking of this stuff out of out of like the debate group. Um, if you're going to practice self-defense, you should do it with some intent and some force and some realism, at least some of the time. I think pretty much everyone would agree with that. So that could be pretty fun. That could be pretty found, foundational. You can get more specific from there to say you should always practice self-defense with realism and intent. You should only practice self-defense with realism and intent. And if you're not getting hurt while doing it, it's not realistic enough, right? So we're starting to narrow up. And the narrower it, it gets, the fewer people that are going to buy into that until you get to something at the top as you're talking about your own philosophy on self-defense that nobody else is going to agree with because it's unique to you. And you can apply the same thing to anything else, physical, any other physical training. Um, when we get into the, the spiritual, emotional, mental side of martial arts, I think if you really dig in, I don't think anybody agrees with, with everything you say. And that's actually, that's, that's kind of my view on religion. You know, you can take, you can go to the, the biggest mega church. And if we were to ask like an infinite number of really specific questions on what people believed about their faith, there would be some subtle differences among every single person there. And so if that's what it is, does it really matter? You know, that's, uh, this, that's, that's Jeremy, the philosophy major coming out. Cause it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It matters. I, my, my, my views on religion and, and broader spirituality, philosophy as it relates to martial arts, uh, can all be summed up by a line from dogma. It doesn't matter what you believe. It matters that you believe you have a set of beliefs you understand something of what they are, you are willing to challenge them, and you act on them. I had an interesting, albeit short, conversation with a pilot uh, who was flying us back from Atlanta. Yeah, I think he was the pilot from Atlanta to Burlington um, just a couple weeks ago. After being delayed. After being delayed. Much less than last year, though. Much less than last year. <laughs> last year, I was delayed 14 times in Mobile, and this time, we were only delayed, I think, three times. It was only only two hours instead of, like, eight. And he made some comment, and, and it, was, it was political. I'm not even going to repeat it. And I actually agreed with his premise. But my, my challenge to him was, do you believe that people do what they feel is wrong? Because I don't. I think 999 times out of 1,000, if someone's taking an action, they believe it is the right action. When everything is said and done, where it gets different is what we value. We all value different things. I may value money or freedom or, you know, a big pizza. You know, and you mm. may value something different things, you know, where I'm valuing money, you may value freedom, or you may value safety, or whatever else, and if we don't have the same values, n we're never going to agree on those things, and sometimes you got you to gotta dig deeper, so where does that apply in martial arts? It applies when people come in to train, and you don't understand why they're there, what is it that val they value that brought them in? If I come into a class and my goal is fitness and yours is, and you, you teach the school and your value is self-defense, we're probably not going to get as, the same thing out of class. We're probably going to feel differently if, or maybe a better example, if we both start the same school the same time, you're looking for self-defense, I'm looking for fitness, and we're in the same class, at least one of us is going to be disappointed. If the instructor is trying to cater to both of us, we'll probably both be disappointed. So under, understanding what it is that 
motivates people? What is their motivation? What do they value? I think that's pretty important in, in life, whether you're looking at it as a martial artist or not. Um, sorry. I'm... Don't apologize. No, not about anything. That. I was oh. enjoying a very interesting conversation about getting seasoned versus crusty in terms of aging. Seasoned versus crusty. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to step in on that because I don't consider myself either. You wouldn't either. Scott, Rob, and James seem to have a good hand on it. I don't think any of them are. I mean, I mean, I. None of them are are, are old enough to use those terms. I mean, I'm not on sure. Which side of thirty you're on? I'm not sure how old <laughs> Rob is, and he does strike me as someone who could be who could uh, uh, maybe get crusty at times, but not from age. Seems like he has that element to his personality. I can say these about these people because I know them. They're my friends. Um, let's grab another question off here. <laughs> was the show successful from the start? Absolutely not. However, you need to decide what success is. Uh, and that's actually something as, a, as an entrepreneur I encourage people to define before they start what does success look like. Because if you don't def- know what your goal is, if you don't know what that success looks like, it can be really easy to burn, you know, 10, 15 years of your life just expecting it's going to get better. For the first year, if I look at the numbers, for the first year, the show was flat. Like within within three months, maybe less, we had hit a plateau on listeners. And then in a year, it just went this. And it's continued to do that. And it's not quite as steep as it was, but it continues to trend upward. Nothing happened at that one year mark. I literally didn't do anything different. There's nothing I can track it back to. It was just all of a sudden, oh, okay. It's interesting because the podcast platform is is pretty old. Like the the the, the method of mm-hmm. delivering uh, content in this digital only platform is is pretty old. But um, I feel like recently, it's it's had an uptick in general consumption for, for people who consume media. Yeah. Uh, podcasts have been becoming more popular because people have more and more devices with them in which they, like, whether it's a smartwatch while they're on a run, and or whether uh, there's a lot more ways to consume it. And so, I mean, uh, I'm a IT person and I love technology and I, I listen to, like, ten podcasts now and five years ago I didn't listen to any. Right. So, I mean, like, I think there's a trend there, too, and Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio was at the right part of that that upward trend. Well, podcast audio itself is, is pretty interesting. Uh, podcasts have been around for about 10 years, if I remember. It was like 2007, 2008. Yeah. Ricky Gervais started it, if you ask him. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> He's wrong. Um, audio is the only media format that you can fully engage with while you are doing other things. If you are watching video, if you are reading a book, you can't really do other things. I can, I can listen to a podcast or music while I run or wash the dishes or go to the gym, you know, whatever. And there's an intimacy to that because most of us are consuming audio through headphones, meaning it is the only thing we're hearing. And that creates a familiarity and that, that ties into why people want to know about me, right? It's weird. But at the same to- by the same token podcasts I listen to, I feel like I know those guys or girls, right? I feel like I know those people because I've spent hours with them in my ears. They've had control of my ear balls. There's an Archer reference. (laughs) Are we not doing phrasing anymore? We're not doing phrasing. (laughs) That's not good. We're good. (laughs) 14, we're still going. Oh, the one other thing I wanted to say on, on the subject of, of podcasting, kind of where it's at. The last numbers I heard, we were still under 15% of the population had listened to a podcast. So we have so much further to go. Um, we're, and it's not ready yet, but um, if, if you if you ask very specifically, Alexa, who is unplugged right now, because sometimes she listens and says things at inopportune moments. I totally get that too. Yeah, it's 
that moth is driving me insane. We've got an echo dot. Uh, Need the chopsticks. Everybody says so. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I can get chopsticks, and then you're gonna just watch me go around like this for the a next. A little bit more country in my solution. You got any spray on deodorant and a lighter? <laughs> I do, but I'd rather not set my house on fire. That'd be a terrible episode of the show. Save it for the last five minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there's just there's really nowhere to go but up on podcasts. How have you, I'm going to kind of change the question a little bit. How have you implemented the physical philosophies from CrossFit, gymnastics, parkour into mm. what you're doing for your own martial arts training or presenting to the classes that you go and instruct? Sure. So the idea of, of this kind of fusion, because that's how people think that, that it implements for me, this idea that I'm fusing parkour and gymnastics and CrossFit and the various styles of martial arts I've taken. It's really not a, a fusion because, and I've said this on the show, there are only so many ways the body can move and only so many of those make sense through the, the guise of combat. What I have taken from these other things is an understanding of how the body works that martial artists don't always consider. You know, the, the idea of biomechanics, the idea that there are certain things that are really efficient. Um, you know, and I'll give a really practical example. It, the way, to my knowledge, every school teaches a front kick, four steps, knee up, out, in, and down. I've never, and I'm not saying this doesn't happen, I've never been part of a school where at any point we were taught to round off those corners. It's always knee first. If you think about it from, a, from the perspective of physics, the sooner you can get that foot engaged, especially not waiting for the knee to stop, because that's what we're taught, right? Knee, bang, bang. If it can become one motion, knee leads, but foot is quickly following, the physics on that dictate more force. I've played with this. I've kicked, I've kicked the bag with this. It generates so much more force, it hurts my leg. So there are things like that that I'll combine. And when I work with martial artists, honestly, half of what I'm working on when I'm working with martial artists is getting people to understand their own body. And it's not a martial arts problem. It's a societal problem. The idea that, that people can't drop into a squat, the idea that I mean, when I, when I coached gymnastics, I had eight-year-old children who could not squat down. They spent, you know, I mean, this was as far as they would go. They would go from here to here, right? And, and so to get them to drop lower, right? I don't know if the camera is going low enough that you can see my feet, but I'm squatting. And, and this is, the body is designed to do this. So just working on stuff like that, I mean, that's really, that's what's happening. I, I, or you come into schools like ours. I, mean, I remember when you first started training with us, and we're like, "Okay, we're gonna do front rolls today." You're like, "Okay, what kind of front roll?" <laughs> <laughs> and you've had a bunch of different ways of front roll right away. I mean, there are there are ways that it, it blends in, and you you do blend it in. Well, I think. I mean, I, I've said before that my my view on martial arts is it, it's like it's like Trivial Pursuit. You know, I may have played Trivial Pursuit. You know, you 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 roll around that, that pie or call it a pie, right? Is that the official name for it in Trivial Pursuit is a pie? Because you get those wedge pieces. Right. Yes. Right? I call it a pie. So you have your pie and the first style you do is the biggest wedge, assuming that you, you stay in there and you let's say you get to a black belt, some some level of competency. That's the biggest wedge. And each subsequent style, the wedge gets smaller. You never fill the pie but because there's overlap, you're not adding another chunk again, you know, as big of a chunk again. And to me, that's important because you're, you're trying, whether we're looking at it from the perspective of growth or self-defense, diversity is good, right? And, and, and I did this, the, the episode Mastery versus Diversity, and, and I like both, and I think both are, are incredibly important. 
But if you were to force me to choose one over the other, I'm going to choose diversity because a diverse martial artist is better able to respond to more situations. Tristan Creeley asks... Hi, Tristan. Tristan is on Team Whistlekick. He is awesome. Mm -hmm. And I find him inspiring because he's... I think he's got a year on me. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe, a, little, maybe a little less. And uh, dude's pulling out some new moves in his forums. If you, if you follow him on social media, he is killing it. And if you want to find out just what that difference is, Tristan has been on the podcast before. I don't know what number, but... He has been on the podcast. Easily. He has been on the podcast. Um, but his question is, when you first decided to make sparring gear, how did you learn to make the gear? Where'd you start? The story of the sparring gear. So here's the condensed version. Um, I bought sparring gear and I was excited. And then within a couple weeks it started to rip and then I was sad. And I said, wow, that stinks. And I looked for companies that could do it better. And I didn't find anybody that was doing what I thought it should be. So I came up with some designs, worked with a prototype firm. And at the end of the day, it was me sitting in a factory for several days with factory staff and we're cutting stuff by hand and then they're going and they're, they're assembling it and bringing it back and we're bouncing ideas back and forth. So what do I know about making sparring gear? I know a lot now. <laughs> I, know, I know the ins and outs of how this works. Um, I didn't know a lot then. I just knew there was a better way. Based on the chatter, there is a motion trying to be started of having everyone send you chopsticks. <laughs> so let's not ever tell them your address. Because it's really them. hard to find the address. <laughs> right. I just realized I never changed my shorts. I'm still wearing the ridiculous pseudo Hawaiian orange shorts. Luckily, we're still in the nice range of appropriateness. Nice. There's many people telling you that you have a that you're a tremendous interview and you have the perfect voice for podcasts. Why, thank you. That's not the voice you use. No, it's not. <laughs> I don't that's know. The, that's the voice you use when you're pretending to be you. <laughs> that's weird. Go through a stretch where you start using that voice, though. <laughs> Which voice? The real voice or the fake voice? The fake voice. I don't know. We all know the real voice. Um... Oh, I have a question that... Is that a judgmental look from a cat? Yes. Is there any other kind of look from a cat? Um... <laughs> I have a follow-up question that really only a couple of us would know. Have you ever told anyone outside of, like, me why Whistlekick is called Whistlekick? I've told a few people. I'm not ready to share that publicly. I know the answer, too. I'm, I'm yeah. not going to spoil it. That's all I needed to hear. No, there, there is a reason. Um, I would love for that reason to become a thing. had not happened yet. It'll happen. <laughs> It'll happen. I just need, you know, $100,000. I liked the moment. No, any investors, those are also people you can connect Jeremy with. Mm hmm. But actually connect and don't just say, you should really talk to this guy. <laughs> know what you gotta do. <laughs> kind of petered out on questions. That's fine. I got more here. Um, so, one of the questions I get often who is your favorite interview? And it's a fair question because, well, yes, if there's only one person in the room and I have who has been on the show and it is a private conversation, I will always answer that person because um, that's just the, the fair weather friend that I am. But when you're in a situation where multiple people in the room have been on the show or perhaps it's a public venue and you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, it's a much more complicated answer. I'm not that interesting. <laughs> but that's not that's not it. So, so when for me, yeah, it's no, really I, hard to focus right now. The cat has her leg behind her head, doing cat things. Zuza, can you stop doing that? Daddy's working. Are you trying to get another judgmental look? As a little backstory behind Jeremy's stop. initial answer, I was very animatedly pointing to myself behind the yes. laptop yes. screen. Um, I don't have a favorite. And the reason I don't have a favorite is because it is how I feel about the episodes changes. 
even though the episode itself is static in time, my knowledge of that person and who I am are both shifting. And who I am on, on a given day shifts. So I would imagine that where someone was at in their training, in life, and how they felt on a given day when they listen to a particular episode is going to dramatically affect how they feel about it. And, I, and that's, that's good. I think that's by design. It's not by design. It's, it's not a bad thing. Because it means that we're being authentic. I've had conversations with both of you, and I'm sure everyone listening has had conversations with certain people that were great because of where you were that day at that time. But if you had had them on a different day, if you were in a different mood, would have meant far less to you, maybe even been offensive. I've had plenty of people tell me things that, you know, they were being helpful, but I was just in a jerk of a mood and I didn't want to hear it. You know, sometimes I even told those people off. But if I'm in a more receptive, hey, what do you think I should do about this kind of a mood? I'm less likely to tell them off. Can you listen to your episodes and enjoy them? I don't listen to them. Do you think you'll ever get to that point? <sighs> Which one did I listen to? Um, I listened to part of one recently, and I listened to um, the Master Ken Matt Page episode uh, about a year after it came out. And funny enough, not a pun, I was in the car and literally died driving, even though I was listening to myself, laughing, listening to him. I don't like the way my voice comes through. You know, I think we all have a different sense. Maybe you don't, as a as a musician, you've probably heard your from my voice so much. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't phase you. Not but I, I, d- I remember it being really weird to hear my own voice. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't like the way I sound, and because I'm a bit of a perfectionist, I hear all of the things that I do wrong. I don't hear the right. I hear the wrong. Now, what's happened over the last three years is I'm almost able to participate in the episode and extract myself and listen to it. I'm kind of running parallel tracks. So I can be in the middle of asking a question and hearing myself ask the question and know that I'm screwing it up or I'm not happy with the way that is going. So that allows me to adapt more on the fly. So I feel like I get, I get that, that self feedback uh, in real time. I have a mildly tied in question. At least I can probably tie it in if I have Go to. for it. Um, Andrew Smith asks, does the fact that some of the world's best teachers are in Vermont surprise you? Like Julio Fernandez or for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Charles Murdoch for Hima? So the question about great instructors in Vermont, it's... Martial arts has these pockets and the Northeast is definitely a pocket. California is a pocket. Florida has become a pocket. And this is not to disparage anybody in other parts of the world. My suspicion around martial arts in the Northeast, the only, my, my only theory, and, I, and I'll admit, I haven't thought about this much, so this is not a fully fleshed theory, is that it's around the weather. It gets cold in the winter. We don't have a lot to do. So we spend time training. It also takes a certain kind of person, and culturally we have historically had certain types of people in the Northeast. And those people, for whatever reason, seem to have resonated with martial arts. We have what seems to be a higher percentage of martial arts schools per capita in the Northeast than, than we see in other places. Um, do I have hard numbers on that? No, because I don't know that they exist. 
Oh, there's a project coming that contained all that. <laughs> the curse well, of having constant ideas. Hawaii is quite the melting pot, too. It is a melting pot. It's not. It's not quite as prolific because there's just, they don't have the land mass to do it. But the, uh, I mean, it's it's wild how many different cultures are represented there, and brought with them the various arts uh, from all over the world. Not just Eastern martial arts. Right. Right. Now I and and. You know, I, I think the other thing I have to respond to, Andrew, is there may be some bias here. You know, because we're in the Northeast, we see primarily people from the Northeast, and we, are, we know more about those people. Uh, if you look at the folks who have been on the show, the majority of them are from the Northeast because it's the personal relationships I have that I can leverage to get people on the show, especially in the earlier days. But there are exceptional martial artists everywhere, and they don't always showcase how exceptional they are through competition. And that's one of the challenges, is that's what we tend to use to define exceptional, right? We're, we're looking at rank, or we're looking at competition, because there really are no... That those are the closest things we have to objective, and I can't use bigger finger quotes than the, the, the biggest finger. Four finger finger quotes. <laughs> um, you know, objective metrics for what defines a, a great martial artist. Goes back to my comment on value. Depending, if I value. Um, creative, competitive skill, I could have an instructor who is exceptional at that. I could also value practical self-defense. And that very same person who is an exceptional martial artist in one way could be a terrible martial artist. Um, we have a question from Matt Nather. Nather. I'm honestly not sure how they pronounce their last name. I probably should. I'll go with both. Um, <laughs> They're very helpful. Yes. Matt and Jenny. They're great people. Do you have a time frame or goal set to achieve what would be considered a master rank in any of your various styles? Oh. I think I know the answer to this. Let's see what you have to say. Um, I plan to never use that title. Me either. Um, which is... Yeah, Fumio Demora doesn't have to. I mean, he, he probably has a long title, but he goes by Demora Sensei. Like, sense teacher is has it's, a lot of honor in it in its own name. So one of the one of the episodes that's that's been hanging around on the Thursday side um, that we haven't done the research on, but I, I have this theory, and I've shared this with people, and, and they they've agreed with me, but again, I haven't done the research. My theory is if we really dig into the way we're using the term master in English, if we translate that back into the, you know, like in Korean, when we think about Taekwondo becoming a master, my theory is that we'll find that there's some nuance to that word that we're kind of throwing aside. You know, the idea of master in English, I mean, that, that, I mean, there's a couple connotations. One of them is, is rather unpleasant in, in historical context. Uh, but the other, um, you know, hopefully you're not offended because this, this is your Taekwondo title. It's not a title I like. Okay, good. Um, th to me, there's an arrogance to it. Um, I wrote an article about this in the Martian Journal. Mm -hmm. I totally did. I feel like, it, is that your new one? No. no, I haven't oh. written a while. Okay. It's it's probably my latest one. Yes. Okay. So Yeah. I'm sure I know I read it. Yeah. I don't remember it. And that's I think I came up with some really cool title like Grand Supreme Great Grandmaster or something. Now I remember that. <laughs> like, I, remember I, that. I can't I, so. I, I, 
I I got a little bit snarky in it um, uh, because there are some some people out there with really long titles that they insist upon. But yeah, we could we could probably talk all night about titles. But, we could, and I don't want to. But uh, yeah, I like Sensei. I think Sensei Lesniak sounds nice too. The, to me, <laughs> the thing about titles is it's all in. It, it's like clothes. How do you wear it? Yeah. You know, I know people. That's a, that's a great way to put it. I know people. So, my Taekwondo instructor, your original Taekwondo instructor, Master Rota. There isn't the you 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 know him. Oh, yeah. you've, you've worked with him. You've taught Super him. Good guy. Yeah. There isn't the slightest bit of arrogance when he is Master Rota. You don't hear Master in any way from his conduct that is is conceited. The first day I met you was actually the same first day I met him. Oh, what, really? Yeah, it was. We were we were teaching at uh, at Master Lenahan's school. Um, another person who has the title that gets it from his teacher. Like, I just remember this guy having this huge smile on his face <laughs> that we're teaching him how to hurt people with sticks. <laughs> like, and he was happy to and yeah. happy to be a proverbial white belt. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That was. Yeah, he's a great guy. And so to me, that's kind of, that's, that's where it is. It's, it's how do you wear it? You know, that there, do I strive to master the material that I'm working with? Yes, absolutely. Um, do I hold it against anyone for using that title? No, because you could be Mr. or just go by your first name and still be an arrogant putz, and I would still dislike you. So it's not it, it, it's not the title that that I, I think is the important piece. But and actually, I don't know that it ever aired. But I had a conversation with Scott Bolin, and and you know Scott's become the driving force behind Marshall Journal, MarshallJournal.com. If you guys haven't checked it out, it's it's. Um, a lot, quite a few of the people who have been on the show, actually, have we had, yes, we have had, have we had people that haven't been on the show yet, right? Yes. Scotty, the person who wrote the Get Rid of Women's Class article? Yes! Yeah, that was good stuff. So, um, it's a lot of the same people that have been on the show, because, again, pulling from personal circles, but it's been a really fun project, and, and thank God, Scott Bolin is around and he's helping make that work. Sorry, I keep touching your foot. Um, but we had a conversation around, he and I had a, a personal conversation, and I won't share the details, about his transition from, from being reluctant to be anything other than Mr. Bolin to accepting the term of sensei. You know, and again, I don't think it matters what your title is as long as you're comfortable with it. If you've put in a buttload of time and you feel really strongly about using the term master, if you feel that you deserve it, use it. Just because I disagree doesn't mean I'm right. I but I know it's context too. Sure. If if we're in Target and you come up to me and you shake my hand and say I'm master so and so, I'm probably not going to like you from day one. Flat out, I just that there, there is something to be said for humility. Your rank speaks for itself. I'm not wearing a belt right now. I am still every bit the martial artist that I have been. So this is what I was getting at uh, before with philosophy, in that I think there are some schools where the core philosophy, that there is an aspiration to be the guy. And to be and and that it's not about the humility. It's not about exchange. There are some teachers that, is a, and some of the be, what I consider some of the best instructors are the ones that are, that understand they can learn from their students, and not that they're not the only one with knowledge, and that you must come eat at my table only, and I am the and everything else is discount. Like right. I, I I know some other instructors who are who have suffered abuse from those sorts of egos and took years of recovery to get over that sort of toxic ego that stems from a title. Right. From somebody first, like, pumping that person up, giving them a title, and then beating you with that title. I don't think it's philosophy. I think it's a culture. 
because I think that even within very close knit groups of schools, sometimes schools within organizations, you can have dramatic differences in culture. And I think that that culture is really important. Culture tends to persist, can be really hard to change culture. One person can change their, their philosophy, but the culture of the school tends to exist and, and, and you don't get a lot of opportunity to change it once it's established. It is very top down culture even. Like if 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 the if the yeah. people who are leading model the thing that they want to change, Absolutely. that's what will happen. If they like if they model rigidity and they model discipline, then you'll have a discipline class. If they model being loose and sure. unattentive, it'll be loose and unattentive. Like, but if they model having big egos, you're going to start that culture of egos. Yeah. Well, I think, and I kind of want to hop on camera. For sure. This. You I, can, like I, I can, can swap out. I've been sitting a while. Cool. It's all warm for you. I appreciate that <laughs> so much. Oh, it's cozy. I like it. I think particularly in Western cultures, everybody wants to be a cowboy at some point in their life. And that, to me, is John Wayne sauntering into a saloon. And that's needing to know that you're the baddest guy and having master in front of my name or supreme ultimate grandmaster fire fist man. Fire fist. Deadpool 2. Deadpool 2. <laughs> is the way to do that. It's a very passive way of asserting dominance while letting people think that I'm not asserting dominance. It's an attempt to assert dominance. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and... But, and I think that... Well, Jeremy stews. I'll keep talking. Because <laughs> I have to jump back a little bit to kind of fill in all of the blanks that I wanted to chime in with, but you guys were doing such a good job. For me, I think that kind of tying into your mistranslation theory, there's just a gross overgeneralization between master means teacher, teacher means master, and that's where, because I remember before I started martial arts, as a very young child, I always thought since I meant master, it was mm. not until much later, I'm not going to say how much later, because I couldn't put a time frame on it, that I'd learned that it either means teacher, or one who goes before, or one of those many other right. various things. Right. So for me, I've always, ever since I had the title of all five-ish years, I've always thought it was kind of a misnomer because I haven't mastered anything. I've learned stuff. I think I've earned the right to have the title if I want it. And I accept it because it's what my school thinks that I should be called. And I'm okay with that. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just... Okay not something I appreciate. I'm not even a fan of being called Mr. Goodall. I would much prefer if people called me Brendan, but I also understand that formality is a big part of martial arts. Yep. In some schools. In some schools. In some, and, 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 and there, yeah, there's culture. There's culture there, too. Um, you know, one of the potential topics for tonight had been uh, what on the back channel I was referring to as Grandmaster A-Holes. <laughs> um, with, without without the censorship, um, but I don't I don't think I want to go down that that road because it's it's something that gets me pretty fired up and it can be a dark rabbit hole. Yeah, it, yeah. It can be hard to climb yourself to climb out of it. Yeah, we we've been having some some good light but fun and I I think valuable conversation. You know, like these these little chunks, and I don't want to spend thirty minutes talking about this. There is an episode brewing for that. Um, I'm slowly getting more and more comfortable with the idea of putting it out there because when you, the moment I say, you know, I'm not comfortable taking the title of master and, and, and even if it is forced upon me, I won't be comfortable with it. There are people out there who are going to hear that and think that I'm judging their usage of it. I'm not judging their usage of it. I'm judging the term as I understand it because of how it might apply to me. I have plenty of friends who use the title. They are wonderful people. Not, not just you. No, Other I, people. I figured. Right. Uh, 
but the moment I start getting heated over the way some people with the title of Grandmaster conduct themselves, there are people that will try and draw correlations between what I'm saying and certain people, you know, and, and, and you might be thinking of one person in particular, there might be some folks listening, you might be thinking of one person in particular. Um, but there, there are, there is a broader set of people who use the title Grandmaster. I mean, it's all over the place and it's not, I feel like I did a poor job explaining that. Let's just say I'm not going there yet. I don't mind ruffling feathers, but if I ruffle the feathers, I want to make sure that I'm saying what I mean to say in the right way. It's very thoughtful of you. Hmm. I try. I do try. I have a question. How do you differentiate between the martial aspects of martial arts and the artsy aspect of it? Not artsy like you're going to go paint stuff, but <laughs> I find a very definitive line of I like more of the art of the martial arts. I like the finicky technical details a little bit more than I like learning practical things mm, that I could defend method. myself with. Yes. I've never thought of it, but my gut reaction is it should always be blurry. Mm. Yeah. Everything that you do that is artistic should have some element of practicality to it. And the most practical things that you should do should have some artistic element to it. Because what's another word for artistic? Creative. Mm -hmm. And if you're... I mean, what, what's the, the grand example of practical? It's self-defense, you know? So if someone takes a big swing at you. If the thing that you do every time is the thing that you were shown how to do, you don't know that there isn't something better for you. Because let's be honest, you saw Daniel sitting on the couch next to me. Mm -hmm. We are not built the same. You and I should not be doing the same self-defense movements. Probably ever. Nope. 300 pounds, 6'4". Not 300 pounds or 6'4", right? Yeah. So it's a whole different ball game. Now, I should try the things that you do. You should try the things I do. Because a good portion of martial arts, a good portion of life, this is my newest philosophy on life. Life is about figuring out what not to do, which is why the happiest demographic is that like 60 year old, 60 to 70 year old person, because their body is still mostly intact. They can still do pretty much whatever they want to do. Maybe not as well as they were when they were 20, but they've narrowed up what it is they want to do. They know what they want to do. Whereas when we're, teenagers are in our 20s we're like ah i can do anything and we spend all that time doing everything and learning what we don't want to do we start dating we learn who we don't want to date so in practicing martial arts as it relates to self-defense anyway i'm learning what doesn't work for me i just taught a Kind of hybrid. Oh yeah, I forgot to ask you how that went. It was super fun. I yeah, love working with the fifty plus crowd because and my main reason and my initial knee jerk is knee jerk reaction is they're not afraid to ask questions that anybody younger than them would think is stupid. Cool. Because they understand their bodies well enough to know that if I do this wrong, it's gonna hurt. Mm. Good call. Yeah, we have to have a, a longer conversation mm -hmm. about that. I want to know more about what happened. I was a little focused, a little distracted when he got here. I was not a good brother. Didn't ask him. You no, know, there's time. I don't think we're going to stop being friends after this episode. Right. <laughs> I mean, there's still time. We got <laughs> right. We got 11 minutes. Let's see what I can do. <laughs> we got anything else that's come through on there that is important? Scott said, I'm so glad you feel the need to touch Daniel's foot while talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling a little left out. Jeremy, get on it. <laughs> That's better. Okay, so foot touching is now a thing for... We're martial arts. First in, High foot! High for, foot! First Ninja Turtles! Woo! For centennial episodes, the best. touching is a thing. Whistle kick, whistle kick foot touching. Stop, just stop. Okay.
Just it's gonna. Why it's, don't you talk about it's so what's close there. to off the rails. Why don't you talk about what's on the table because I'm kind of curious about. Oh, all right, and it's oddly foot related. It is foot related. So, um, so I made some shoes. Is that in frame? If my face is in frame, this is in frame. So, some high tops. They're not training shoes. I've worn them a few times, so there's dirt on the floor now. Logo on the inside of the tongue. Um, they're custom. They're handmade, one at a time. See, this is one of the one of the, the few perks. No, yeah, one of the few perks. The, the main perk is getting to meet amazing people, but um, I get to prototype some shoes and then wear them and uh, put it in the research and development category of the financials. Uh, I mean, even the box looks cool. The box yeah, is I box. love the box. That's impressive. Whistle kicks by Jeremy Lesnack. That's me. There you go with that voice. <laughs> the, <laughs> Jeremy using the Jeremy voice. <laughs> As a side note, reach out to me after the pro after the podcast is done, and I might let you in on some of my ideas for whistle kick that all rhyme with them. <laughs> that rhyme with the whistle kick name. Mm. We've mm. talked about a few of them. That's a whole other market. Yes, it is. I don't think we can do that. That's why I said after the podcast. So, Be careful how you type things on Amazon. You might get search results you weren't looking for. Yes. So <laughs> when are you branching out into the basketball apparel? Um, well, because I think Jordans when I look at those sneakers. Well, that was, that was part of the inspiration, right? Um, but what makes Jordans Jordans is that there was a Jordan. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a Jordan. You know, we do have we, have... we have folks on the team, and we do have some brand ambassadors, and, and we're... You know, we're cultivating some of these personalities because some of these people that I get to work with are really cool people and they, they deserve to have more attention on them. And we actually just did our, our first um, apparel partnership with one of those. Oh, um, cool. this, this young man named Christian Bayonne? Bayonne? I, again, I don't talk to these people so I don't know the pronunciation of their names necessarily, but let's say Christian Bayonne. Uh, a young man who has the nickname Diesel. So, you know, we batted some stuff back and forth, and there's a shirt on the website right now that's his shirt. And it's got a really bad silhouette, B-A. -B like, I'm, I'm trying to follow my own rule about not cussing, which is difficult for me. You know, and, and he's got, like, this great hair, so we did a silhouette, and it's him with a sword, like, half pulled. It's just, it's a sweet shot. So, he's got his own shirt. You know, and that's the stuff that I like doing because, you know, how, who doesn't want to have their own shirt? I mean, I, I don't, my name's at least figuratively stamped on all this stuff. I don't, I don't need to put it like on the shoes, even though it's on the box, which I didn't know they were doing that until they sent it to me. But um, if you want your own custom pair of whistle kicks, uh, you can get those on the website. I found some of their questions and some of them, one of the typos is actually... Oddly topical for you? Yes. I love oddly topical typos. It's, it's, how's your superfood training going? My superfood training is <laughs> awesome. Um, there's a lot of chlorella and spirulina as part of my morning routine. Uh, I do take some bilberry and, uh, and there's a mushroom. Really meant super foot, yes. But, yeah. yeah. But superfoot is not in most people's yeah, right. phone yeah. I don't dictionary. Know. I had a journalism teacher in college who knew who he was because I tried to swing the old black belt articles that he used to write by as a viable source for me to write about one of my favorite kickboxers. <laughs> <laughs> he said no. Nice. Um, Anyone out, out there that has the, had the opportunity to train with Bill Wallace, a.k.a. Superfoot, uh, knows that his system is simple but not easy. If you haven't had the chance to train with him, you should. Um, he travels a lot, so unless you don't get out of your house, you have the opportunity to train with him in the next year. I would almost guarantee it. So the training is getting better. Uh, I'm getting better. Uh, I was told a couple weeks ago that I was continuing to improve, which, yay. I mean, that's, that's the goal. That's what we're looking for as martial artists is continual improvement. Uh, I'm feeling more confident and competent 
with the material. Cat wants food, but she's going to have to wait a few minutes. It's fun. It's, it's, I like, I like feeling like a white belt. I like feeling like I don't know anything because that's, there's so much opportunity for growth there. Maybe not nothing. I like to feel like I know a little bit because when you know nothing, it can be really intimidating, but it's good to remind yourself of what that feeling is like because that's what brand new students coming in feel like. Jumping back towards the, have you ever considered interviewing a newbie in martial arts? Mm -hmm. You could probably find a black belt who is comfortable speaking about their martial arts journey and is looking to try something new and have that be kind of a hybrid approach to the podcast. We've had people on who have talked about that. Actually, there's, um, if you're a member of, of the group, uh, Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes, you know that a few weeks ago I posted in there that I was going to get to interview a musician. That interview happened and will air in the next few weeks, and this particular individual holds a black belt in one style but started over in something else. So we have seen that. Um, see it again. We'll continue to see it, I'm sure. Because there's something, there's something about the personality of the martial artist who's willing to come on the show. They tend to value that repeated exposure to new information. Along those lines, uh, Adam Clucci says, uh, what's one martial art in particular you've always wanted to try but you haven't? That I haven't. It's Kung Fu. I mean, it's a short list of stuff I haven't done. But it's Kung Fu, and it's Kung Fu for, for the hands and, and for the distancing, uh, which is part of the reason that I'm training in Kenpo Jiu-Jitsu, because the hand work is very Kung Fu-ish. Very. I've also wanted to train Kung Fu. There's a school in South Burlington, and, I, there is. and I've been meaning to check it out. I have a, a, a friend of mine down in Maryland who been studying Kung Fu mm. some really interesting sword forms. Nice. I would like to try fencing. Mm. I can hook you up. Really? Yeah. We should talk about it. I know a guy who's very good. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's the nice thing about What's Quick too, is it brings people together and helps keep eating martial arts. There's a, it's mm -hmm. like you said, if it gets people in, and this gets people in and puts them in a washing machine in yeah. martial arts and gets everybody mixed up. I just want everybody training. Even if it's not forever. I just want everybody to train for, you know, six to 12 months. And learn some of those benefits. Get better. So uh, another question. We've got a couple minutes left. What do you feel is the most useful style that you've trained in for self-defense? Uh, I'm not going to answer that question as is. Yeah, so here, here's the problem with answering useful style in self-defense. I've never been to two schools that teach their material the same way, even if they learn from the same instructor. So to say a particular style, it's really a particular person. And, it, and I'm not just, you know, taking that as a, as a dodge to that question, because when people ask me what style should I take, my, first, my, my counter is forget that, find the instructor that resonates for you. I think about like lifting weights. It's like... Each time you curl, you have the potential to make your arms stronger. It doesn't matter, like, there's lots of different ways to curl, but you're still getting stronger. Mm -hmm. You're still getting better. Someone might show you a different way. Oh, why don't you try curling this way? And you might get something a little bit better. You might get a little bit stronger in a slightly different way. Right. And it all sort of pieces together. But more importantly than how you curl, if we're going to extend that analogy... If you sign up at a gym that is too expensive or you don't like the atmosphere there, you know, that's dirty, it's always closed when you can get there, etc. Why do you see how much I can curl? You're not going to benefit. Right. <laughs> so, you know, find the instructor. I did a whole episode on this and actually I wrote an article that got published in a few places on this. You know, it's, it's not, forget the style. I, I think, you know, I... We're adding so many styles and substyles that I, I suspect in the next 50 to 100 years, martial arts may not even have style in, in most schools. I think we might transcend that. And I don't know that's a, that that's a good thing, but it's just what I think will happen. 
Oh, it's time? This means time? Ten. Oh. Oh, it's ten. The, to me, this means ten Whoa. minutes. <laughs> yeah. Let me finish my thought, and then I'll, and then I'll wrap up. Um, no, I, I just, I want, I want people to, you know, we talked about philosophy and value. I want people to identify what is important to them and find a person, an instructor who can present information that supports that value for them in their training. And I think one of the worst things we've ever done is getting bound into only training in certain styles and pretending that there is this dramatic amount of consistency across styles because it's not it's not um and and why i feel qualified to say that because i don't think that there are too many people who have traveled and trained in as many different schools as i have i mean there are certainly people who have but statistically i've trained i'm going to say i've trained in more places than 99 percent of people And I've seen the dramatic differences. So it's just, it's, it's people clutching onto something that I don't think really exists. So we might as well just let it go. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just wrap up. So I want to thank, I want to thank you no for problem. coming on. Daniel, I want to thank you for coming by. I want to thank you guys for your help and your support and, and I want to thank everybody out there, too, for, for watching. It's so cool doing a video episode. I'm going to be really honest. This probably won't happen for 400 because I was stressed out all day long getting all this ready. Uh, it, it sounds trivial that, you know, we're just running a camera off a computer to do this. But there's so much more work that has to happen on the back end to make this successful. And I enjoy doing it. Um, I have some thoughts about making perhaps more of a permanent setup out in the warehouse to do video. And if that happens, maybe we'll do some more video, but who knows? Uh, thanks for the questions. We had way more questions than we did last year, which was super cool. That's all I got. So thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. I appreciate the support for the show for Whistlekick. And we'll call it good.